Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We are in the Gospel of John, chapter 2. We'll resume our study in verse 11 today. So get your Bible, open it up to John, chapter 2. We'll begin in just a minute. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Study the whole Bible in its entirety. Genesis through Revelation, all 66 books, Old Testament, New, every verse, verse by verse, with me, at your pace, at your convenience. Go through the Bible three times, all archived for you. All you have to do is click and listen. That's at the Bible, verse by verse, dot com. So check it out, and if you haven't already, begin a verse by verse study with me. You will not regret it, because it's the Word of God, and only the Word of God. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, John chapter 2, verse 11. Jesus has just done the miracle at the wedding in Cana, where he changed the water into wine. That was his first miracle. And he had some of his disciples with him along with his mom. And it says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested both his glory and his disciples manifold, or I should say, manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. And he just barely getting started. But they never seen anything like this. He hasn't even begun to scratch the surface of what he's going to do in the next three years. But it's good. A taste of what's to come. And then it says in verse 12, And after this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples. And they continued there not many days. So the miracle in Cana revealed the glory and the power of Jesus Christ. And Jesus looked like a normal man. Jesus was a normal man. He was 100% human. But when he did a miracle, the glory of God was revealed in him. When he did a miracle, he proved that he was God as well as man. His miracles made a statement about his deity. And along with the word of God that he spoke, helped the disciples to come to believe in him. Verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, you might be tempted to read this verse and pass it off as being rather unimportant for us today. But, If the Bible doesn't say that Jesus went to Jerusalem for the Passover, if he, let me put it this way, if he did not go to Jerusalem for the Passover, like the Bible records, if Jesus doesn't go to that Passover, then believe it or not, you and I are going to hell. And there's nothing that anyone can do about it. No one can save us. It's true. If Jesus skips this Passover, we go to hell. You say, well, does he die on the cross at at this Passover? No, not at this one. But it was required by God that every Hebrew man attend that Passover every year. To not do it would be to sin. If Jesus doesn't go, he disobeys God. He disobeys the law of God, which means he's sin, which means he's not perfect, which means that his sacrifice on the cross, even if he would go to the cross, would be completely worthless. He might as well stay off the cross. The sinless Son of God the perfect God, the perfect man, 
had to be the spotless sacrifice in order to be the offering for our sin. And he was. Good thing he went to this thing. 14. And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and overthrew the tables. Verse 16. And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of the house of thine house hath eaten me up. Jesus was furious. You don't see him furious that often. But the thing that made Jesus furious was sin and, of course, dishonoring God, which sin does, but that made Jesus angry. It was righteous indignation. The Bible says that you and I are to be angry and not sin. You know what that means? We should be angry at the things that make God angry. This idea that you have to be a mellow preacher, never angry, never upset, is foreign to Scripture. And it's foreign to what Scripture teaches about Christians too. If something makes Jesus angry, it ought to make you angry. And this made him angry. Using holy things like the temple, and the temple sacrifices to make money was sinful. It was wrong. Using holy things like church and the Bible and even the title Christian to make money today is just as wrong as what they did in the temple complex that made Jesus so furious. If you use the name Christian to somehow make a buck, you are wrong for doing that. Not to make money that misrepresents Christ. And you see how upset Jesus was about these sorts of things. And I'm not saying it's wrong for a minister to receive a free will offering. I'm not saying that it's wrong for a minister to collect a salary that labor is worthy of their pay. The Bible says that those who are taught the word of God should give to those who teach. But I'm talking about those who scheme to make money through their so-called ministries. I'm talking about people who sell prayers or sell special water from the Jordan that supposedly cures cancer or some other kind of nonsense. I'm talking about people who think the ministry is a career or who charge X amount of money to go preach somewhere. That is blasphemous. That is disgusting. That is as sinful to Jesus as what they were doing in the temple. If you sell tickets to go preach, or if you lay down, this is what I want, minimum, to come and preach in your church or come preach in this service, whatever it might be, you are out of line. That's making merchandise of something that is holy. And by the way, it goes for quote-unquote Christian rock groups or Christian singers of any kind. If you sell tickets, don't you use the word Christian and don't call it a ministry because it's not. You are making merchandise of the holy name of Jesus. And he's furious, just as furious as what he was when he cleansed this temple because they were using that which was holy to make a buck. It's making merchandise of something that is holy. And believe me, you're going to feel the sting of Jesus' whip in one way or another. Jesus said to his apostles a little later on, freely you have received, freely give. And he was talking about getting out the word of God. 17. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house has eaten thee up. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, 
and therefore have a zeal for God, then anything that dishonors God is going to anger you. They sure got Jesus' blood boiling. And I don't know about you, but I want to like the things that Jesus likes and be angry over the things that Jesus is angry over and despise and loathe those things that Jesus despises and loathes. I want to have his attitude toward everything. And I will if I'm under the control of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Spirit, filled with the Word, then that's exactly what's going to be happening. The reason why some preachers don't point out sin and aren't upset over sin and false doctrine is because they're not walking with the Lord. If they're saved at all, they're not walking with the Lord. Their walk with the Lord is pathetic. Because if it was real, they'd be upset at the things that upset Jesus. And they'd rebuke the things that Jesus doesn't like, that are wrong. Because when you're filled with the Word and filled with the Spirit and close to Jesus, you act like Him. Your attitude is like Him. 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Boy, the religious rulers never seen anything like this. This guy who's not even sanctioned by them, this Jesus fella from way up north, out in the Hicks, that place called Nazareth, Hicksville, to the religious leaders and most of Israel, comes down here and cleanses the temple and tells everybody that this is the house of God and quotes scripture and condemns them for selling things. You know, of course, the Pharisees and religious rulers let this stuff go on. Didn't bother them. And they want to know where Jesus got the authority to do these things. Well, if the rulers would have spent more time with God and less time promoting themselves and marketing their ministry, they would not have had to ask Jesus for a sign of his authority. If they would have spent more time with God and more time reading the Word of God, apart from the lens of their human traditions, then they would have recognized that Jesus cleansing the temple was a sign all in itself. Because it was written, the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. Our Lord's zeal for the purity of God's house was the fulfillment of an Old Testament messianic prophecy. If the religious rulers would have prayed more and read the Bible more and paid less attention to their religious man-made rules and their system and themselves, then they would have recognized that what had been going on in the temple under their watch was wrong. They were so far from God and so ignorant of the Word of God that they didn't even recognize how terribly wrong that was. They would have recognized that Jesus was holy and righteous to put a stop to that shameless, blasphemous marketing of God Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. He just predicted his death and his resurrection after three days. He was talking about the temple of the Holy Spirit, which was his body. He said, destroy this temple. You You want to know what my authority is for cleansing this house of God? Kill me. And watch me come back after three days. That'll prove it. When, when Jesus said, I'll give you a sign that I am who I am, destroy this sanctuary, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up in three days, the Jews thought, well, that's a good trick. You mean to tell us 
that if we destroy this temple that has taken 40 some years to build, you're going to build it again in three days? That's what they thought Jesus was saying. But they misunderstood him. Like I said, the sanctuary of which Jesus spoke was his physical body, which of course housed God because he was God manifest in flesh. Jesus was saying, you want a sign that I'm Christ? You want a sign that I'm the Son of God and therefore have the right to drive all these blasphemous, sinful marketing people out of my temple, out of my house? Here's a sign, kill me and in three days I'll come back. I'll raise myself up. A dead man raising himself from the dead is more than enough proof for any reasonable person to see that Jesus is God and that everything he claimed for himself and everything that he said was true. Because he doesn't come back from the dead if he ever committed a sin, if he ever said something that was not true. Verse 22. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So after Jesus was raised, it clicked. What Jesus did and what he said about what he did and, and how he said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. All It, it went over their heads right now, but it clicked with them after he was raised. After he was raised, they said, oh, that's what he meant when he said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. We get it now. And with verse 22, we see that it is important to continue to read the Word of God or listen to the Word of God being taught, even if you don't seem to be getting anything out of it. Sometimes you won't get anything out of it. it won't, nothing will jump out at you. You might be scratching your head. What in the world does that mean? What does that have to do with anything? But continue reading and studying the Word of God, even if that is the result. It's important to take in the word, even if you don't understand it right at the moment. The disciples didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. They didn't understand the word of God when he said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. They didn't understand his words when he spoke them, but they listened anyway. They took in the word of God anyway. They continued to take in the word of God from him anyway, and then later on it became clear to them. See? That's how it works sometimes. And then they were blessed. Sometimes the Word of God does not have personal meaning to us at the moment we hear it. And nevertheless, read the Word. Study the Word. Listen to the Word of God being taught. Because even if you don't need it today, even if you don't understand it right now, you will need it and you will understand it in the future, and it will bless you. I remember as a pretty new Christian, you know, I always just loved the Word of God so much. And I remember just studying the Word of God, reading the Word of God, and reading, 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 and thinking, I'm not getting anything out of this. But I just kept reading it because I had such a hunger for God's Word, and I didn't seem to be getting anything out of it. Well, I, I recognized the words, but... You know what I mean? It didn't click. It didn't seem to have any relevance, any significance. And then I remember, sometime after that, talking to somebody or explaining something to somebody from the Word of God, and the answers were in my mind. And it was, it was what I had read. And I thought, this isn't doing me any good. Well, I, I didn't say that. I didn't think that. But I, I you know, I was, at the time, I was thinking, I don't seem to be getting anything out of this. I knew it was right to continue to read it, even though it didn't seem like I was getting anything out of it. And sure enough, a while later, 
the word of God was on the tip of my tongue and I was speaking it because I, because I had put it, I had put it in my soul. And then when I needed it, the Holy Spirit brought it to my, my remembrance. See, same thing, what happened to these guys? 23. Well, now it says now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. The Bible says that many believed. Many believed in his name. But for many of the many, it was a shallow belief, like the Bible says, based on his miracles. When the miracles stop and their flesh is no longer being tickled, they will stop believing. Faith that is based on miracles is a shallow faith. A faith based on the word of God is an unshakable faith. If you bring people into your group or your church, whatever you call it, with entertainment, that's what you wanted them to. You, you didn't win them to Jesus. You want them to entertainment. And when you stop entertaining them, they're going to leave. You just got to keep coming up with new forms of entertainment to keep them from getting bored. If you win people to your church by your intellectualism because they're so impressed with you, that's what you've won them to, your intellectualism. You haven't won them to Jesus. And when they get bored with you, they're going to leave. But a faith that is based on the Word of God, because that's all you give out, well, you might not win as many people. You might not get as many followers if all you do is give out the Word of God. But I'm going to tell you something. The followers you get are going to be saved. And their faith is going to be rock solid. And they will be faithful. And they will persevere. As long as the Word is getting given out, they'll be there. Because that's, that's what they're hungry for, because they're saved. 24. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. He didn't make a commitment to he didn't he didn't trust them. Their faith was superficial, and Jesus knew it. He didn't count on any of them because he knew that they were not serious, not really serious about following him. Yeah, they believed in Christ, but to them, Jesus was just another thing in their life, a neat thing, a really neat thing, who did things that they could not explain, miracles. But he was still just another thing in their life, not the thing, not the most important thing. Some people say that they believe in Christ. There are those who call themselves Christians. But Jesus is just another thing in their life. They're not saved, my friends. If Jesus is just another thing in your life, you are not saved. There are people who call themselves Christians. Jesus, just another thing, tacked on to the rest of their life. He's just something that they tack on the rest of their life. They don't see him as being the most important thing. And they don't treat him as if he's the most important thing either, because he's not. Their faith is as superficial as the faith of these people in John chapter 2. Jesus knows it's not real. And I say you're not saved. If Jesus isn't the most important thing to you, if he's just something that you tacked on without repentance and making a commitment to him, dead serious, then you're not saved because the Bible says to those of us who believe, Christ is precious. Obviously, he's not precious to you. So you don't believe, not saving faith. You can be one of those many who on Judgment Day, he says, depart from me into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels because I never knew you. And you're going to be shocked because you thought you were saved because some idiot preacher told you that you were. All you had to do is repeat the prayer, the sinner's prayer, and you're saved. 
Liar. 25. And needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Jesus knew better than to trust in the shallow approval of man, because he knew the heart of all men. Let's clear something up for all listeners right now. Jesus is God. He is God, not a God, but the eternal, all-knowing, everywhere present, all-powerful God and sole creator of the universe. And I say that because some cults proclaim that Jesus is not the eternal God. He is just a God. The Mormons, for example. Yeah, he's just a God. You can be a God too if you do enough good works. There's tons of, millions of, millions of gods out there, each one in charge of their own planet. They were used, they used to be men, but they're a God. Liar. Doctrines of devils. I don't care how good they look on the outside. Doctrine of devils. Jesus is the God. There's only one God. I am the Lord, my glory I will not share with any. I am the Lord, there is none besides me. And there's also a growing heresy within so-called Christianity that teaches that God and Jesus do not know everything past, present, and future. That's becoming very popular. They say God is as surprised by things that happen as you and I are. Screwy. Screwballs. If the people who followed and supported those heretics would simply read the Bible, they would know that they were following liars, deceivers. They would know that instead of being supported, those teachers, they, they, they would know that instead of being supported, those teachers should be exposed and cut off. Jesus knew. Don't say that Jesus doesn't know everything about everything, past, present, and future. Jesus knew what was going on inside of all these people who claimed to be his followers. He was not surprised by their superficial belief. The Bible says, The sure foundation of the Lord standeth firm. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who belong to him. And so we see that a person's outward behavior can sometimes mask their true self to other people, but never to Christ. Jesus knows if our hearts are set on earthly things or eternal things. Jesus knows what's going on in our minds. You as a Christian may slip into sin. It may be a degrading, depraved sin. But Jesus knows that you feel like dirt. You feel like a man who f fell into a pig pen, wallowing in the mud, and you can't wait to get out, cleanse yourself, and act like a human being again. He knows that. He knows, he knows that you sinned, but he also knows that you love him and that you're going to repent, you're going to confess, you're going to have a fresh start. And you feel terrible because... You hurt the one that you loved. He knows that about you. You may not look like a Christian to others, but Jesus knows if he is precious to you. And if he is, you're saved. If you can take or leave sin, no big deal. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet a nickel on your salvation. I'm out of time. Continue studying with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. Please remember I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination, so I... Would like it. It'd be great if you would stand with me, pray for me, pray for the Word of God. I appreciate that so much. And when you're studying the Word of God, take a break. When you take a break, click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. See you later.